Good evening, good evening, good evening. It is great to be with everybody again. I'm kind of enjoying that intro music. I'm now hearing it in my head off the times. And so, uh, but this has been an absolute joy and it is it is a joy to be with you once again tonight. Uh, I am uh, Wes Moore. I am the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation. Uh, and I'm a very, very, very proud uh, sign fellow. And, uh, and so for this, this seminar, um, our last seminar, uh we're gonna highlight the importance uh of first changing narratives in order to change realities uh about how images become realities and uh and and how do we think aggressively and think about not just from historical context but what do we have to do to be able to understand how storytelling has been an absolutely key component to social movements uh in which stories we need to highlight and why and how do those stories in many ways become many of our, our, our North Stars? And so I am so incredibly grateful to be here with all of you tonight. And, and because this is the, the first, or sorry, the, the final of other seminars, um, I, I first wanna actually start off uh, just with a huge thank you. Um, a huge thank you to Amy Dacey for, for, for not just the invitation, but for, but for your leadership. Um, you know, Amy, I, I remember when we first touched base on this and you told me uh, that, that I was being invited to do this. Uh, I can't tell you how meaningful that it was, the chance to be able to work with American University. And as I stated the first time, um, is my mom's alma mater and a chance to work with so many remarkable students and your remarkable team. Uh, you know, Charles and Lanesha, who've, who've just been absolutely spectacular to work with. Uh, I, I think about all the students that we've had a chance to build with, you know, Zaria, who you're going to hear from a little later on today, who has done a tremendous time, a tremendous work with this seminar, but also from Robert and from Jennifer and PJ and Kushi and, and, and Sam, uh, who I've not only really enjoyed working with, but just learning from. Uh, and also uh, from Fritz, from our team, who has been absolutely spectacular. Uh, and, and Fritz is not only the kind of, uh, the kind of person, but the kind of friend who you want to be engaged with and, and a partner in the work for, uh, for a very long time. So this has been an absolute joy to be able to work with all of you and to do this work. Um, and I could not be more excited specifically about this topic because we know that whether you're talking about everything from women's suffrage to the civil rights era, to the end of the apartheid movement, in South Africa, so much of this stuff has been around narrative change. You know, there's a great line. Um, there's a great line in the movie, The American President, when, uh, when Michael Douglas, um, who, was, uh, who was playing the president, gives this speech at the end. And he talks about how you win elections. And he says, you tell people to be afraid of it. And then you tell people who's to blame for it. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you win elections. Narrative. It's this understanding that words matter and narratives matter. Telling us what to be afraid of. And then also telling us how we should live up to our better angels. And that the truth is, is that what Michael Douglas said in that movie is actually very accurate, right? Because that is actually how social movements have happened. Because for a long time, we've, you know, dominant narratives have created persistent and oftentimes false perceptions about people. And specifically when we're talking about, you know, the issue that we focused on in this seminar is for people who are living under the weight and the scourge of poverty. People who are struggling within our economic system and the narratives that have been created around them. 
we've seen it throughout this measure of market history, where before any policy change, the first thing that happens is a narrative change. It's a narrative change first, and it's policy change second. It's telling us what we are afraid of, and then creating policy that then protects us from that. Or it's telling us to live up to our better angels, and then creating policies that actually allow us to do that. But it's the person that wins the narrative who wins the day. We've seen it when it comes to how people were demonizing social services in the 1970s and the 1980s, this idea and this interpretation of welfare queens, where in the 70s and the 80s, this trope was perpetrated by politicians to gin up an anti-government and an anti-poverty resentment, where the welfare queen stood in for the idea that Black people oftentimes were too lazy or to work, relied on public benefits just to get by, paid for by the rest of everybody else, the upstanding citizens. That this, this image that was drummed up, that this was a person who was promiscuous, having as many children as possible to beef up a benefits take. And again, regardless of what data showed, there was a narrative and it was potent. And we watched how that helped to fuel a crackdown on people living in poverty, huge reduction in benefits, and frankly, something that still remains very powerful to this day, where we've watched policies continue to reinforce this. We've seen it when it comes to immigrants, where we have a long history in this country of painting immigrants oftentimes as the other, where some of the dominant narratives that have driven this fear of immigrants include criminality, drug dealers, human traffickers, terrorists, from Italian Americans to Irish Americans, to Polish Americans, to Mexican Americans, where these groups have been vilified at different times in our nation's history and account for not just how this happens and how this narrative takes place, but accused of everything from taking away jobs from native born counterparts, depressing wages, exhausting social services. These stereotypes, along with countless others, are used intentionally to paint false images of the most vulnerable in society. We've seen that oftentimes even, I think about my service and my time in the military, where oftentimes it's this definition about who is the enemy, which makes engagement simpler. Narrative change is important because stories can either separate, but when used at its best, they're used to bring people together. You know, they've been passed down from generation to generation. That people don't relate to issues, they relate to other people. And in other words, they relate to their stories. And once we understand one another, once we can identify our shared vision for a better world, and we work to actually make that better world a reality. If one person tells a story about their experiences dealing with poverty, audiences might just see it as an individual, but as other people share their stories on this topic, patterns emerge. And also, as we start looking at the data, we start to see human faces. By uncovering the social nature of the problems, groups can then truly formulate an action plan to actually solve the problems. I thought about it in the work in the first you know book that I wrote with the up from the other West Moore and. Uh, called the other West Moore. And I remember because I have more of a quantitative mind than a qualitative mind, like I really like data and like information, and that kind of stuff. And I remember having this conversation with my publisher once, when I, I wanted to do like a 10 step prescriptive guide as to what parents should do or that type of thing, um, you know, to be able to help their children and or mentors. And I remember the publisher said something to me that I won't forget. He said, um, listen, um, that sounds really interesting and all, but I'm gonna be very honest with you. No one wants to read a parenting book uh, by a 30 year old with no children. And I was like, that's actually a really good point. And he was like, tell us the stories. Tell us the story of these two kids and we'll understand the point that you're trying to make. Tell us the stories and we will get an understanding of what message that you're trying to share. Where James Baldwin once said, you write in order to change the world. 
knowing perfectly well that you will probably that, that you that you probably can't, but also knowing that literature is indispensable to the world. The world changes according to the way people see it. And if you alter, even by a millimeter, the way people look at reality, then you can change it. And that's the reasons why the two people that have agreed to join us tonight, why I'm so excited to share them with you. Because that's exactly what they have done. They've altered the world and they've changed the reality in the way people view themselves and others. And so first up, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce Marquise Daisy, who's the director of the recently released March on Washington Keepers of the Dream documentary film. Uh, it was produced by National Geographic Studios uh, in association with The Undefeated. And the documentary really traces the ongoing journey of the entire civil rights movement, but looks at it through a measure of longevity. It looks at through the eyes of the heroes who marched for justice and equality in the 1960s, and also the experiences of those who took the front lines for the current fight for racial equality. If you have not seen this film, I would urge you to see this film. It is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, uh, and, and literally from the very first scene, when he walks through this idea of, of what happens in so many hearts and minds, of African Americans in this country. He walked us through Ahmaud Arbery. He walked us through the continuation and how that serves as a continuation. It just was absolutely brilliant. Um, and he's also the, you know, the, the co-director of Baltimore Boys, as you can see behind him. Uh, he's a producer for ESPN Films. Uh, amongst his most notable work include Rand University, which is a 30 for 30 film about the career of Randy Moss, who's one of my favorite players coming up and also Black Hoosiers, uh, a Spike Lee uh, little joint on the high school years of NBA Hall of Famer Oscar Robertson. So uh, I am absolutely thrilled and humbled to, uh, to have you join us here, Marquise. And so thanks so much for, for making the time tonight, man. And thank you for having me. I, I, you know, this is obviously like a huge privilege and um, you know, I'm just super excited, you know, and big fan of your work. Um, so thank you for having me. This is awesome. No, oh, blessings, man. I'm a big fan of yours and thank you so much. And, 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 and so, you know, the, the first thing I want to do, I want you to want to start with your most, with your most recent work. Um, when you were pulling everything together for the March on Washington, uh, there is a very distinct story that you were telling with this film and a very distinct arc that you were telling with this story. Tell me about how this even originally came up the process, the idea, and then, and also, and also how that meshed with the timing, uh, the timing of our society that this kind of fell into as well. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, right? I mean, I think, you know, like I've been at uh, ESPN Films, um, you know, I work within the 30 for 30 world. Um, and I've been here since 2014. Prior to this, I was at HBO Sports. So like my first job out of college, out of Williams College was television. Um, and so this is all I know. Um, but, you know, since, you know, like recently, like I, I got a call from Kevin Merida, who is the overseer and the sort of the, the founder really of um, The Undefeated um, on ESPN. Um, and he gave me a call and he was just kind of like, you know, we have this opportunity to tell the story of the March in Washington, um, you know, starting in 63 and culminating in 2020. Um, and we're gonna sort of partner up with uh, National Geographic so that's how it started. You know, Kevin Merida gave me a call and I was just kind of like, yes, let's do it. Um, secretively, though, I was just kind of like, you know, I come from a sports world. So I was like, how do I tell this story? You mm -hmm. know, in sports, like, you know, I can hide behind highlights and like, you know, sort of like I can fill time with that. Um, but with this, I was just kind of like, you know, there's a story that needs to be told that's super important to me as an individual, but also to people who look like me. Um, so as I started to develop this film, you know, one of the things that sort of uh, jumped out to me early on was Dr. Martin Luther King's message back in 63. You know, he obviously like there was a plethora of messages that like he gave at the famous I Have a Dream speech, um, you know, at, at that moment. But one of the things that sort of really jumped out to me was this sort of um, this relationship between African-Americans and the police and the judicial system. 
And I just thought that that was brilliant that like he foreshadowed that in 1963. Um, and if you fast forward to 2020, um, Yolanda King, his granddaughter, sort of spoke about that moment. My grandfather talked about this in 1963. Um, you know, what we're seeing in 2020 and on the, on the heels of, um, you know, what happened with uh, George Floyd, Mr. George Floyd. Um, so in developing this film, I was just kind of like, how do you, how do you um, create a lineage between 63 and 2020? And to me, it was what it took for people to sort of galvanize themselves to get up and protest, um, you know, black folks in general, um, like what was it that like got them to get off of their couches and get off of their, you know, um, and, and get out of their homes to get out and, uh, and, and to protest at that moment. And to me, like the, 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 uh, the, like the, the theme throughout the whole thing was basically, you know, people were just basically fed up, mm -hmm. you know, they had, um, you know, they were on their last breath, you know, they were, they were just kind of like, you know, everything that we've been fighting for in terms of like equal rights and, and things of that sort, um, is right in front of our faces right now. Like we are fed up. Um, but there was that, there was that theme of just sort of like, um, you know, the relationship between the police and the judicial system and African-Americans that just made sense. So that's the way that I built that film. Um, and it just made sense to do it that way. But, but I, and, and you did a great job of, of helping people to see that it wasn't just like an individual fed up, like this was a collective, right? So it's like in these stories, you, you, you felt like as people were watching it, everybody felt that frustration. Oh, yeah. Everybody felt how fed up everybody was. And the amazing thing about it is some of the comments I've heard from folks who have said like, yo, I watched this thing and I was like, this is crazy. Like, like enough, enough, enough. They weren't black folks. Right. right. There was this collective idea that there was, that this actually pierced at, at not just the souls of black folks, but it pierced at the soul of humanity when watching how this thing plays itself out. How, how, do, you, how do you think about that in, in, in terms of the context of the movement and what it is that, that when, you know, how to turn that moment into a movement, knowing that it means that it's not just the oppressed that are then feeling that tension to be able to move and do something. Absolutely, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I, I like to consider myself a young 38 years old, um, but I'm a student of like black history, right? Um, but when I started to um, research this film, one of the things that like really struck me was the participation of, you know, non-African Americans in 1963. Like people came out in, in packs, um, like white folks were there. Um, and obviously like it was a political scene and it was a political culture of the country that was very difficult. But if you look at those images, like there were a lot of white people there. Mm -hmm. um, and like that struck me. Um, and if you fast forward it to 2020 on the aftermath of what happened with Mr. George Floyd, um, it was the same thing, but it was like, you know, but it was at a, a, a larger level. Like people were just outraged um, in a sense that like, this isn't about black and white. This is about humanity. Like this isn't right. Um, and for me, like that was something that we needed to like really focus on and really highlight, right? Um, because like, you know, again, like when we're talking about race issues, like it's really easy to take a side, right? Like it's really easy to say, you know, I'm with the black folks, or I'm with the white folks. Um, but to me, like it was bigger than that. Like this, this whole movement really from 63 to 2020, like there was some, there was a bigger sort of audience there that was bigger than just this divisiveness of race. This was about humanity. And this was about like trying to change systems. As you said, um, it was about, you know, how do we put our feet in the ground and work together to, um, you know, to, 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 to change what we feel isn't okay. Um, and that, and that, that was important to me to like highlight that, that like, you know, obviously like, you know, within African-American history, there's some things that are like very, you know, um, ugly. Um, but at the same time, you know, we haven't done it alone. You know, like we've had um, people who, who've supported us, who haven't necessarily looked like us, um, who've been along for the ride. Um, and that was important to sort of give the just due to those who have been there 
you know, from 63 to 2020 and to recognize that like, you know, this is an ongoing struggle. Like it, it it's an ongoing struggle that's not gonna necessarily change, um, but we have to do this together. Mm -hmm. So that was important for me to sort of highlight that within this film. And it, it was it was it was really thoughtful on this idea that that this was that this was almost like a baton passing. I I remember I remember the scene of the uh, uh, of of the and I'm not giving anything away. I, I, everyone needs to go see see this movie. But but the the woman who was thinking about uh, you know the, the the marches and the protests and just and literally started crying, um, you know, on where and you watch kind of this whole arc of emotions where when she first starts the interview, it's almost like last cheering and celebratory and by the end of it it's like in tears yeah. and it, it makes me think about the you know uh, there is this there is this uh this uh, this idea and this this idea of the, the the danger of this single story right that sometimes when we can allow the single story to be able to uh to be able to dominate that it, that that sometimes uh we risk a critical misunderstanding and I, and I think it's you know where people you know and we see that kind of danger of the critic of the of the singular story oftentimes being used where you're taking an argument and then spinning it on its head so for example the person that makes it out it's uh, of, of a bad situation then the then the danger of the narrative of the single story is that it's because that person worked hard right without understanding the depth of the challenge of a system that actually makes that exception so complicated uh, and, and, and something that we need to be careful on how much we cheer when you consider the fact that there's still a whole system that is uh, that uh, that that is, is, is forcing uh, that exceptionalism to become so uh, that to become so rare. How do you think about that as a as a filmmaker? Because there's something to making sure that you have a captive a character or a lens that you're capturing the audience. But the danger of of making it that that becomes the definitive thing that oftentimes can make the larger story that you're trying to tell complicated. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, like it's just it's it's really about just being authentic in terms of like you know what we're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, like this work that we do, um, this work that I do within the historical sort of standpoint and in filmmaking, um, it's very, very, very subjective. Um, and, you know, like it's, it's a huge responsibility that like we all take on, right? Um, you know, as we start to um, build these narratives, like we, we need to understand that like, if you do it right, like these films are gonna be around for a long time. So like it's it's on us to tell the right story, um, or tell the story that we think is 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 correct. Um, and, and and one of the things that I that I like to try and um, sort of model myself after is just kind of like putting out a product that the audience will be able to sort of um, make up their own minds about. You know, like I, I like I don't want to sort of editorialize what people are watching. Um, it's just about like sort of providing the facts um, and just giving the audience, you know, you, you, you got to give credit to the audience and you, you just got to give them credit to sort of take what they want to take from it. Um, but you don't necessarily want to sort of drive them in a certain direction. So to, to me, it's just kind of like, it's not about like the winners or the losers. It's just about provide the facts of like what happened um, and leave it up to the audience to sort of um, take from it what they want to take from it. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I think that like that's the um, the sort of the lane that I try and take. And 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 I think you look at your work and you look at your impact, and it's not lost on me nor anybody um, that we're talking about this as the trial of Derek Chauvin is is just just begun. Yeah. Um, where you know we've waited ten months for this trial for an understanding of what type of justice is going to be delivered for for the murder of Mr. George Floyd. And and people are, you know, and people are are, are I mean are, are watching this this trial, not just closely, but literally eyes peeled, watching this trial to see, you know, to see what the final results and what the final verdict is going to be. Um, when you think about your work, when you think about your contribution, when you think about the fact that we now have this trial, you know, taking place, um, but it's being done in a context, a context of the fact that we've now just witnessed the world's largest and longest yeah. protest over a singular issue 
in the history of uh, in the, in the history of this planet. Um, how do you think about the work that you have pulled together in the context of being part of a larger awakening that this country is still very much in the process of going through? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to me, like that's hugely important for me. You know, like I, I feel like a, you know, I am uh, for the most part doing my part, right? Like I'm doing like whatever small part that I can do, um, I'm trying to do it. And that's through my professional life. Um, but also in my personal life, like I feel like, you know, the work that I try and do is um, pretty much a microcosm of the way that I grew up. Mm. Uh, like literally every film that I do, I try and insert a little bit of the way that I grew up in it. You know, you, you mentioned like Rand University, right? Like that's the film that I did on Randy Moss. Um, that is about um, Rand University. It's this idea of there's a 7-Eleven um, in a small town of Rand, West Virginia, which they consider their university, right? Like all American basketball players and football players, they don't really go anywhere. That's their university. They stand in front of a 7-Eleven. To me, that is the corner store in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, right? Like when I grew up, the guys who went to the local um, Poor Robeson High School, Boys and Girls High School in Bedford Stuyvesant, all Americans, Somewhere along the line, those guys were standing in front of the corner store. That was their university. Like that was what you aspire to be. Um, and I think that like, for me, like, you know, and, and I look at like what's happening um, with George Floyd's, um, you know, the, the trial right now, and you look at like what's happening in the world. Um, to me, like I can sit sort of comfortably and just kind of say, you know, I've done what I can up to this point to contribute to educating people on what it's like to grow up the way that I grew up. Um, and, you know, and we, we all grow up differently, but for me, through storytelling, um, I feel like the way that like I excel the most um, is sort of inserting a little bit about myself into the athletes or whoever it is, mm. um, I'm sort of trying to, um, to highlight I put a little bit of my personal story into it because I feel like there's a universality between all of us. Um, because like, you know, you, you could tune into any of these films, whether it's sports or whatever it is, um, and you could care zero about the actual sport. But if you could connect with like these life issues and you could empathize with them, um, then you're doing really good work. And to me, that's what I try and do. Um, so I try and just kind of like really put a little bit of secretively my background into the, every film that I do, because like, it's super important. Um, and I, and I think that like, it all comes full circle, right? Cause it's all cyclical to me. Like, it's like what happened in the sixties is definitely happening right now. It just looks a little bit different, mm. but we could sort of insert a little bit of ourselves into the current narrative. Um, I think that people will feel it. Um, and to me, like, that's what I'm going to roll with um, as long as I'm doing the work that I can do. Um, I, I will always bet on myself because um, I feel like my story is representative of this country, whether or not you like it or not. Like, my story is representative of this country. Um, and if I can insert that into the work that I do, I think that, like, you know, I'll do well. You know, fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, you've 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 done it, and uh, and 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 you've made sure, and you use your talent to make sure that that all of our stories are understood in a larger American context. Um, Marquise, I want I want I want I want to ask you to stay with us, um, yes. but also I want to uh, I want to also bring in uh, you know uh, not just a dear friend, someone I've, I've the honor uh, of, uh, of of admiring his work for for a long period of time, and that's uh, and that's Todd Lending. Uh, who is who has literally spent his career uh, telling really hard and difficult stories with the utmost of sensitivity uh, and with a knack for elevating humanity in that work. He is a uh, an Emmy winning and an Oscar nominated uh, producer, writer, director, cinematographer. His work has literally been everywhere from ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, HBO, every 
every part of the alphabet that you could possibly imagine. Uh, and he's the president and uh, the founder of Nomadic Pictures, uh, a documentary film uh, production company based in the Shy, based in Chicago, and ED of Ethno Pictures. Um, uh, Todd, it is such a pleasure to have you here, man. Thank you so much for making the time to join it's us. It's an honor to be here, Wes. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Marquise, it was great, great listening to you. Appreciate awesome. It. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, you have no idea what a joy this is seeing this, uh, seeing y'all up here on uh, on uh, on this virtual stage. And you know, and and Todd, I, I want to I want to ask you know, ask a, a question of you was, and it, and you've had a collection of films which I want which I want to talk about in a second. But I want to first start with the film that first made me aware of you and your gift, and that's Legacy. Um, and um, and and I want to start with legacy, and I want to ask you to kind of give an overview for 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 legacy um, to to the audience. Um, but it's also not just about what the film is; it's what the film did. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about this idea of changing narratives to be able to actually create social change, legacy is such a beautiful example of what exactly that means and what that looks like. Can you share with us a little bit about the history of legacy uh, and uh, what brought you to it? And then what was the, uh, and then what was the, uh, what was the takeaway from it? It's been a long, long time since I've spoken about legacy. So <laughs> I'm doing my best here. Uh, so, so the audience knows legacy uh, was produced and, and made quite some time ago. Um, the film was shot between 1995 and uh, it was finished in 2000. So it was a five year project, what we call a longitudinal film. Um, it came about as a result of a series I was working on called uh, um, No Time to Be a Child. It was a three part series about looking at uh, young adults, children, mainly growing up in various situations of poverty. And the first show in that series uh, was looking at um, urban poverty. Um, and we wanted to look at young people that were growing up in war zones uh, in Chicago, that being specifically the projects, which in 1995 were a nightmare. Um, and there was a, the Tribune did a special article called Killing Our Children. There were new, there were, something like 128 children that were killed in a year. These are, these are young people, 18 years old and younger. And uh, so we decided to focus on several young kids, again, thinking about how do we tell a different narrative? Uh, we wanted to focus on young people that were making it, not that were falling and being crushed by it, because that story we were hearing over and over again in the newspapers, and we hear that today still uh, on the TV news and the newspapers. The, the, in fact, Trump was known for kind of pointing to Chicago and talking about the slaughter that's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, but there was very little attention given to those who were making it out. So we selected several young people to focus on, and one of them was Terrell Collins, a young African-American kid, 14 years old, growing up uh, in the Henry Horner homes in, in a really, really tough situation. His mother was uh, was drug addicted. Uh, his father had disappeared. Um, he had friends in the gangs, but he was doing well. He got, he was getting straight A's. Um, he was going, he got into a decent high school. So anyway, we started filming and the day we started filming, Terrell was, was shot and killed. And at that moment, I had just interviewed his grandmother and then we were about to, uh, we were going to film Terrell later in the day and he was killed on the way home. Um, and so rather than abandon that story, we we decided to look at how does a family deal with loss, a family in that kind of situation? How do they deal with, you know, how many stories do we see even today about the families that are left, you know, with, with children that have, been, that have been killed on their way home? So anyway, we followed the family for six months and it made it into that first part of the series. And I, I became very close to the family. We developed a really strong bond and I just asked them on a lark. I said, do you mind if I, can I just keep following you? I, I, it was, I had no idea how long this would go on for. 
Um, it was the first time I had thought of doing something like that, but I, I just, I felt something really strongly was there with this family. I wanted to see farther down the road, how they were going to deal with the trauma of loss. I had a feeling that they were going, that there were Terrell's cousin and best and best friend, 14 year old. Nicole, who tells the story, it's told through her point of view, she clearly wanted to follow in Terrell's footsteps. So I wanted to look at what's going to happen with Nicole. You know, will she be able to break out of this cycle of poverty? We're talking about a family that's been on welfare for generations. They've been on welfare for, for three generations, four generations. Um, uh, and so they agreed. And uh, I just followed them and I didn't know where the story was going to go. And at the end of about four years, I knew, okay, I mean, Nicole had graduated. She had made it into college and um, actually Terrell's mother ended up getting off of uh, her, her drugs, kicked her habit. Um, and it turned out to be this very uplifting story of a family who was making it out. And I think, had had the story ended differently, it probably that narrative probably would not have done as well, not nearly as well as it did. It was picked up by HBO, was nominated for an Oscar. It had an uplifting, happy ending, and um, it's important. It's important to have that um, as a result of that happy, more uplifting ending coming out of trauma. We were then able, and now I'm shifting into, you know, what the film was able to do. Um, we were able to take it to the hill with the help of, uh, with the totally by the support of a uh, not-for-profit by the name of Generations United, and they took it to the hill. They became uh, kind of the community impact uh, group that really was going to use the film as a tool for social change. And if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't have never, it would have never gone to the hill, went to the hill. It was used as a, as a, as a, as a story, as a narrative um, to inspire uh, public policy, to, to, to inspire uh, federal legislation called the, named after the film, the Legacy Act. Um, it's the most exciting thing that more exciting than going to the Oscars was, was, getting, was, was going to the hill and seeing law signed you know signed by the president um bush of all people at that time and uh and that was to provide low-income housing for grandparents raising grandchildren that that was kind of the essence of that law i mean and, and I, it, it's it's uh it's one of these things when, when i think about when this idea of narrative and it just it, it literally takes my breath away man because um it, it, it did two things it didn't just humanize the issue and let people know how large the issue was. That when people are talking about grand families and they're talking about these grandparents who are taking on, you know, taking on their grandchildren for whatever the reason happens to be, what a massive debt to society they're actually taking on for society. Because even if you took a small portion of that, it literally would break the foster care system, one. And in addition to that, you look at the prospects for so many kids. And so, so, I mean, like, I, 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 what was, how did you even think about it when it was first even proposed this idea that, Hey, we can actually take this and actually use it to create legislation. What was, what was the response? Like how, how did, how did that first interaction with, with generations United, what, what did that sound like? I was just enthralled i mean this is a storyteller's dream i was going to say a filmmaker but it's not just a filmmaker if, if you wrote a book it would be your dream that it could be used in such a way um i i you know i didn't do i didn't make the film with that in mind um it, it makes me think of uh, howard thurman's quote which i'm sure you know mm -hmm. You know, don't don't ask what the world needs. Ask, you know, ask what makes you come alive. Go do it because the world needs people who've come alive. And that film was making me come alive. You know, so that that's why I made it. And so to see it, that's the fruit. That's what can happen. 
when you operate from that place, as opposed to trying to look at the world and fill a gap and say, what does the world need? You, you, it, there's really something to be said about saying, what am I passionate about? What do I just deeply care about? Mm. And see how, what kind of story that, that actually manifests and produces. Uh, but I was, I, I, it would not have done it without the help, uh, without the guidance, not just help, without the absolute guidance and spearheading of it uh, by Generations United. So, I, yeah, I was thrilled, thrilled when they decided to take it on. And a, a few years after that, you talk on another massive issue, and that's looking at the issue of reentry, the issue of incarceration. Uh, with a film called Omar and Pete. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about that one? Yeah, well, that evolved out of legacy. Legacy, um, in terms of my own interests, I, I, legacy really focused on three generations of women. And it's the question was, well, where are the men? And sadly, you know, um, the majority of the men in that community were incarcerated. So I was very interested in looking at their story and, and looking at, you know, the numbers are still ridiculously high in terms of African-American men being incarcerated. And I was very interested in seeing, so what happens when these guys come out? What kind of supports do they get? Why is it so many are, recidivist, are, are, are recidivists? Um, you know, what, what, what's that all about? So fortunately your mom, uh, was interested and I, I, I want to tell the audience in case they don't know, uh, Joy Thomas Moore, uh, was a program officer, very important program officer at the Annie Casey foundation. That's how I met her lovely son, Wes, <laughs> <laughs> who I knew before Wes was really Wes. <laughs> Which is interesting in and of itself. But that's, that's another story. Another narrative. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, Joy, who had supported Legacy, um, was very interested in, in doing some work on reentry. So her, she and her foundation, the Annie Casey Foundation, uh, were one of the funders. And I scoured the country again. I didn't want to tell, you know, it's always so important, I think, as a storyteller to obviously, you know, to not want to tell the stereotypical story. So I scoured the country looking for reentry programs that were new, that were interesting, that were going to really give uh, uh, prison, you know, ex offenders uh, their best chance of making it. And I found one in Baltimore. You know, the, it was a two year program and I and I told them what I wanted to do and they agreed to give me full access. And I followed two men who had been in and out of jail for 30 years. They had been uh, never out longer than six months. I mean, so these were classic recidivists and uh, heroin addiction was their main thing Two African-American men. And uh, I had pre-interviewed 98 men and selected four, knowing that a couple would probably fall off to the wayside as they did. Some, some disappear, um, but these two stuck with me for the two years. So that, that became Omar and Pete. And, and that, that, was a, that was a wonderful experience, making that film. Hard, hard, but, but wonderful. And, but, a, but a beautiful film. And, yeah. but, 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 you, but you, you just touched on something that, uh, that I wanna ask you about is, because oftentimes in society, you know, we have a habit of telling stories of people that we, you know, want to support and help through the, through a deficit-based approach, and you have repeatedly flipped that logic on its head, and you have told stories really from uh, told stories of in many cases our most vulnerable from a strength-based lens. Uh, how did you go through the process? You know, talk about the intentionality of that, of the why, because frankly, the other side, doing it the other way is actually more society's default. Why yeah. was it so important for you to kind of take that, take that lens when it came to telling these stories? I think these, these, I, you know, I've done a number of stories that are focused specifically on African-Americans. After Omar and Pete, it was all the difference. 
which you were involved in, you were an EP. And uh, every time I went into these, I was scared in some ways because I thought, oh my God, I, I don't know what's gonna happen to this story. Um, just for the audience real quickly, all the difference was about two young men um, who I followed through their last year of high school. Again, they, uh, these are two young black men who came from real poverty broken families and uh, you know, the graduation rate for African-American men in Chicago at that time, it was like uh, 2010 uh, was like le less than 50%. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then fewer were even going on to college. So by the time they graduated college, you know, you're looking at, you know, maybe 15% actually graduated college. So I wanted to look at what's going on there. But again, I was really wanting to tell a story that would have some hope to it while being a realistic story, not, not a Pollyanna story, but a story that, you know, you brought it up earlier with Marquise, this, this issue of exceptionalism. And in the story of hope, in stories where, where people succeed, you, you, you always wrestle with that question. But for me, the priority was not telling a stereotypical story that would reinforce the stereotypes of African-Americans, African-American men, African-American women, African-American families, African-American poverty. I did not want to reinforce that. So, uh, you, you know, in the case of Omar and Pete, I was lucky that Pete made it. Omar ended up recidivating, and um, um, but Pete made it, so he counterbalanced that. In the case of all the difference, both of the young men made it. They made it through college, and it was hard. You, you saw the hurdles that they went through. It revealed what kind of supports they need. And I think, you know, kind of circling back now to poverty, uh, that's to me the big issue is support you know what are the supports that we are willing to provide for people in poverty and in thinking about this this piece that we're doing here this little seminar um you know i, I think of poverty it it it's so complex as as you know <laughs> it's a hugely complex issue it depends on what cohort you're looking at, what group mm -hmm. you're looking at, African American, even within the African American community, you can break it down in terms in into smaller groups of what do what do the young African American children need within that community who are in poverty, the women, the men, the those who are addicted. Um, you're looking at it from psycho psychological perspective, sociological perspective, economic perspective. It's it's so complex, and then you can expand that into the Hispanic community, to the Native Alaskan community where I filmed in, where the poverty is crazy. What they need there is very different: rural poverty versus urban poverty. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's a massive subject. So again as a storyteller and this kind of rides on a little bit what marquise was saying earlier which is you know wanting to you know my goal is always to put my viewer in the shoes of my subjects i just think that's the most powerful story to tell that's what you did in your book you know you were going to present uh you originally were going to do an educational manual <laughs> and you ended up telling a very passionate deep soulful heartfelt story you and you put people in your shoes in your shoes and in the shoes of the incarcerated westmore and that's what touches people that's what grabs people that's what's going to catalyze some kind of change from a story i think amen amen yeah marquise i'm, I'm gonna I'll, I'll bring marquise back into this conversation as well and um yeah. And uh, I'm absolutely loving this, y'all. Uh, so, so thank you. And 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 Zaria, uh, want to ask you to come up on our virtual stage as well. Uh, first, with a huge thank you for all the work uh, that you did in preparation for for tonight. And uh, and I want to turn it over to you uh, as we have questions coming in from the audience that I'll ask you to share uh, both with uh, with Todd and Marquise. 
Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so our first question, actually, um, two questions have been answered via chat, but I'm going to pose them here for the whole group as well. Um, the first comes from Jamie from American University School of Public Affairs. Do you think the Rodney King riots of 1992 were a catalyst for change in America? And how do you think that formed the modern day social movements we're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, um, yes. So the, so the answer is yes. Um, you know, that the, the, the Rodney King um, riots and you, that incident in, in itself were really like one of the uh, sort of first of its kind that we've seen on television um, and we've seen on video, right? Um, you, you, you can go back to like Birmingham um, and, and what happened in Birmingham. And, you know, that was like an awakening for the, con for the, for the country. Um, and, and people sort of like woke up because it was like, you know, we know that like racism exists and we know that like, you know, there are bad things that are happening. But like once the country were able, was able to like sort of see it on television, that changed the ball game. Fast forward to uh, Ronnie King. That was something that like, um, I think captivated the, the, the entire country um, and the world in general. Um, because like you actually got to see it on television and you got to see it on video, um, unedited. Like, because I think that like when I watch the video, it's like, I'm not looking at edits. I'm looking at like just the raw video. Um, and, I, and I think that like people just kind of like really woke up to what they were seeing. Fast forward to, you know, 2020 and what we saw um, with George Floyd, um, you could really make the argument that the Rodney King video was the start of that. It was the start of like putting it into your living room um, with 63 and, you know, in Birmingham being sort of the, the birth of it all. Um, but yes, the, uh, the, the Rodney King video was, it was a game changer. Um, and it sort of like, it reshaped the way that we look at race relations um, in terms of, you know, we didn't have to imagine it at that point, like we actually saw it. Um, so yes, I think that, you know, the, the, the Rodney King incident was huge for history um, and it was huge for African-American history um, and, and black history in general. I would, I would only, I mean, I completely agree with, with Mar what Marquise just had to say. Um, I, th I, th I find, it's always interesting to me, you know, these, these that that's a galvanized, that's a point of impact. It's a point of galvanizing uh, emotions and feelings and reactions and re the realities that had not been spoken uh, uh, that are that have to do with race and prejudice and uh, and yeah, Floyd is and is the same situation, and there there have been other other horrific tapes that have been shown um, that ha haven't had that same exact kind of impact. It's it's interesting, you know, which ones do. But George Floyd, I mean, was just yeah, it's it's so unimaginable what what went on there for so long. Um, but it's it's always I I just think it's always important to go beyond the tape and beyond the horrific images that that we're reacting to and really try and understand the systemic uh issues that are behind all that 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 are leading up to that that have just been waiting for a match to light the stack of wood because that's what happens the the wood is already stacked it's already prepared uh, it just needs a match, and those those happen to be the the two matches. And it's it's just we have to we have to deal with it. We have to deal with the wrong that that occurred, but we also have got to spend some time really digging into you know how that wood got stacked up to begin with. Marquise, this second question is for you. Your journey started back in the day when you had the opportunity to experience the world of independent school. How did race or dealing with the adjustment into that world and back to your world mold you as you progressed as a young man of color, oh, uh, as a young man of color, 
then during college, your filmmaking today, and as a parent of twins. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, it's, it's really shaped everything, right? Like, I mean, I, I sort of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but like I grew up in, um, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Um, you know, I ended up going to boarding school um, and then I went off to uh, Williams College uh, in, in Massachusetts. But like a lot of that, to be honest with you, like was sort of um, by sort of coincidence, right? Like it's like, um, you know, like I, I did well, um, you know, sort of like as a elementary school student and, and junior high school student. Um, but then I was lucky enough to, to be paired with like the Boys Club of New York, which is like a, a scholarship program system um, in New York City. And then I sort of got taken off into, you know, this, this boarding school world and then eventually went off into Williams College. Um, but the, the, the whole point is that like the, the experiences that like I, you know, sort of came into contact with really shaped um, sort of the person that I am today, but also the filmmaker that I am today. Um, because like really, like to be honest with you, everything that I do, um, I try and insert, you know, and I work in a sports world. Um, I try and make these films that are like minutely about the actual sport and more so about like socioeconomics and particularly race um, and, and like why these things matter. Um, and I think that like, that's a huge byproduct of, um, you know, how I grew up and where I come from um, and, and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that world that I lived in is, you know, sort of like a high school, junior high school and college student, um, it has really shaped who I am as a father, um, but also who I am as a, a professional and as a storyteller. Um, because like, it's really hard to like, so sort of break those bonds, like that's who I am. Um, and, I, and I think that like, that's the sort of the unique perspective that I bring in my, um, in my field. Um, because there are a lot of storytellers across this country, but I feel like who I am and what makes me sort of unique is my perspective and my journey and my lineage um, and how I've gotten here. So, um, so yeah, that whole world has shaped who I am as a filmmaker, but also as a person as well. Um, and we have another question. Uh, what recommendations do you have to produce a memoir style or biography book and documentary project as a solopreneur without a budget? Any tips, time management, education needed, fundraising? And that can be for yeah, I mean, if, if I could jump in there, like one of the things that I tell people all the time is, um, and it might sound cliche, but just go do it, right? Like the, the, the way that I like sort of learned how to do this whole thing was it was right around where like iPhones was just starting. Um, and I would just like go on the New York City subways and just film on my iPhone um, and just kind of like film, film things. Um, I was at HBO Sports at the time. Um, and after doing documentaries and like pretty much everything, they pretty much let go the whole documentary department. So like we were all without jobs and I had a, um, a decision to make. And my decision was, um, what, what I chose to do was to sort of cut out the middleman. So I wanted to teach myself how to film, edit, direct, produce and do everything. So I was just out there using the resources that I had available to me which literally was my iPhone and I was recording stuff. And then I would wake up at like 6 a.m. every morning, 5 a.m. every morning and look at YouTube videos and teach myself how to edit. Um, so the whole point is, um, you know, if you're independent and, uh, you know, and this is what you want to do, just go out and do it. Like go to your local high school, find the kid who has like a dynamic background and follow him for two or three weeks and tell his story. Like there are ways to tell these stories without money. Um, just find a good story and find a good sort of um, opportunity and just go out and do it and just use the resources that you can at the moment that you, you know, that at, at, at the current moment. 
I, I would only add, uh, I think the question included writing, correct? Writing a biography. Um, so I, I would, it sounds like this person is very open to either filming, writing, doing something uh, in terms of that. And if it's going to be writing or, or f if it's filmmaking, I mean, first choose your, your medium. Choose the medium that you are really passionate about because it's going to take energy and discipline to get it, to make it happen. Um, you, so you, you got a, a difference between writing and filmmaking. It's huge, huge. Um, and I, I actually have just spent a year working on a novel. So it was something I had never done before, but COVID, uh, I didn't feel like going out and filming during COVID. And I've always wanted to write a historical fiction novel, and this was the time to do it. And what I did is every single morning, I mean, I had my schedule and I, and I strongly suggest you, you develop a schedule and you stick to it like you're in the military. I mean, whether you feel like doing it one morning or not, you go and you sit and you do it. Maybe you write just a paragraph that day. Maybe you write several pages. Maybe it's just a sentence. Maybe you're just rereading what you wrote the other day. Just stick to it. Stick to the stick to the plan, and you'll have something at the end. Great advice all around. So our last question comes from Eileen, and she asked, um, and this is for you, Todd. Um, how do you make sure that these stories, accurately representing the realities of marginalized communities, while not perpetuating a stereotype, actually benefit the communities you're working with, rather than being an extractive endeavor? Mr. Lending mentioned one of the works resulting in the passage of legislation, but how can you incorporate a reciprocally beneficial component to storytelling? I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. Um, without it being an extractive endeavor, I'm, I think you're saying without maybe being exploitive. Um, does that, do you think that's what she's saying there? Yeah. Um, the way, the, uh, look, I, I can tell you every single film I make in documentaries, and this is one of the reasons I want to take a break uh, and work on fiction, there is always that question of, of am I exploiting uh, my subject? I'm telling their story. If it's funded, which that's the way I've been able to make my living, so they, they are funded 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, I'm being paid to tell this story and my subject isn't and I can't pay my subject because then that is crossing the line. You are no longer telling uh, a documentary story. Now you're dealing with actors by paying them. Um, so you can't do that. And it's it's a it's a conundrum. It is. I think it is an issue to constantly wrestle with. I think um, the way I deal with it is to be completely honest and authentic with my subjects in the beginning at the very start make it very clear look these are the parameters this is how much time i think this may take are you willing to really be a part of this i, I yeah i'm making this is my job so yes i'm making living telling your story are you okay with that are you sure you're okay with that um in every case, fortunately, um, the subjects have gotten benefits from participating in the films. They've gone out. They are the ones who speak on behalf of the film. Um, and that's that's been with every single film I've made. And they are paid when they go out and speak. I make sure that they get honorariums for speaking. They're, um, in the case of the two young men in All the Difference who went on to college, um, they, there were opportunities that opened up to them as a result of, of being in the film. Um, this happens all the time and you pray that it happens because it's a way for you to feel like, oh my God, at least I'm giving something back here. Um, it is a, it is a strange relationship when you're doing documentaries. That's one of the f joys of doing fiction is I, f I was finally free of that. I was just <laughs> beholden to myself uh and and telling the story i wanted to tell without worrying about oh my god am i exploiting 
I mean, the last film, and it doesn't matter what what uh, group you're dealing with. I mean, I've filmed African Americans, uh, Native Alaskans, um, Hispanic. Uh, in my last film, I was dealing with Holocaust survivors, and I'm Jewish, and uh, so they're my tribe, and and I still had that question. You know, God, these, they're sharing their stories. Or I. You know, am I exploiting this? Um, but again, if you're being authentic, honest, straightforward, that's that's one way to mitigate, I think, that that question. Zaria, that is a, that is a great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, for not just your masterful. Uh, uh, moderation of the uh, of the of the q a but also just all the hard work that you have put into this session and then beyond uh you know we're lifted because of you so thank you so much thank you thank you very much for allowing thank me to you. be a part of it I appreciate thank you it was our joy and 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 to uh to to marquise and to todd uh bless you both um you know you all again i i i'm 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 honored and 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 blessed and not just you know call you friends but also to be your fans um how you all continue to push the dialogue, push us to be better, push us to think differently about things and to reinforce how we should have a context of our society. Um, it's making all of us better. So for not just being here tonight, but for everything that you continue to do for all of us, uh, you know, just bless you both. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for all the good work you're doing. Appreciate thank it. you. Thank you. And, 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 and to, to the entire AU team, um, uh, doing this this semester with you has been a joy and and i think as we tried to weave this idea of understanding poverty and understanding our collective role to be able to address it being able to understand that truth matters that in order for us to move forward together we must acknowledge and confront the hard truths about our past and to be honest about our past and our complicity in creating the type of dynamics that we have within our society uh, understanding the role that politics and government has to actually be a vehicle for change, particularly because politics and vehicle um, is the way that you can not only address it at scale, but the reason that we have poverty is because of policy. And policy and government and government officials have a role to be able to undo that. That philanthropy must do its part and must serve as risk capital for innovating solutions and ideas, but that this moment is requiring philanthropy to push harder and to think differently. That business cannot be afraid to leverage its outside influence to actually advocate and promote social and economic justice. And it's not just a smart thing to do because it's the right thing to do, but it's a smart thing to do because it will actually help you to enhance your business model and create leverage market share because consumers are moving on their values. And tonight, that stories matter, that we wanna change policy and outcomes, but first we must shift the narratives of those we are trying to support, those we are working with, the why and the what's next. It has been an absolute honor to be able to do this with all of you, uh, an absolute honor to be able to be under the under the leadership of, of Amy and Charles and the nation, the entire team, all the student associates we had a chance to work with, all the guest speakers to include Todd and Marquise, who have given their time and their energy to this. And also to all of you who have checked us out this entire semester. You know, thank you for spending your evenings with me. Thank you for being engaging. Thank you for asking thoughtful questions. And thank you for the change that you're going to continue making in the world. I look forward to seeing y'all very soon, but for the final time for this semester, thank you and class adjourned.